Perfecto. Ok, so we will follow now with um, Jaime Awe, Changing Spheres of Interaction in Terminal Classic Western Belize. Awesome. I think I have one like this. How are you guys doing? Great. Excellent. I want to start off by thanking a bunch of people. I brought my, so just so I could remember all the names. Um, Alexa, Patricia, Ariane, Patricia, Lindsay, and Diana for bringing all of us together in this awesome meeting. I mean, really, this is, this is great. Um, you know, I haven't been around so many Latin Americanists for quite a while, so I'm really enjoying this. Um, if you see me hobbling around, um, some of us are still pendejos, even though we're <laughs> way past our prime, is still playing soccer, so I got injured on Sunday. Yeah, um, another pendejo actually went after me a little strongly, so. But anyway, um, <clears throat> Without much ado, let me get right into, into this. Um, to begin with, I know that many of you are not Mayanists. In fact, I know Ariane is. Anybody else is a Mayanist here? So we are rare in this crowd, which is good. So what I want to do is first contextualize where and when my presentation fits in Maya prehistory. And I'll be talking mostly about the Terminal Classic period. And this Terminal Classic period, as I mentioned a little while ago when I posed my question, was really a, a period of time that witnessed some of the most profound and consequential changes in the Maya region. But from you know, speaking with other colleagues, we know that this was also a very consequential time across Mesoamerica, right? major changes going around Mesoamerica. And some of those changes include major transitions, um, major cultural transformations. In fact, I noticed you talked a little bit about international styles. And very likely, those international styles are sort of made easier because of the rise in maritime trade around the same time period. But this period also witnessed the decline of many of the ancient polities, the capitals of the Maya area. And in many cases, people abandoned those cities and there is no evidence for cultural continuity, right? In fact, things cease until reoccupation of those areas some years later. This terminal classic period, the way we date it in the Maya world, is usually the two centuries between 750 and 950 AD. Now you will notice that I put 1050. And the reason is that the effects of the terminal classic, right, were not even across the board. I like to tell my students that, you know, it's not like, I know you guys have seen Monty Python movies. You know, it's not like, you know, the guy going banging on the drum and says, okay, pack up your bags. It's the terminal classic period. You got to get out of here. No, it didn't happen like that. Right? It is protracted, right? That some sites are affected much earlier than others. Some people cling on and they don't want to leave. And that's certainly the case that we see. Another important perspective for you to have is that the area that was especially affected around the Terminal Classic period and all the stressors that were going on at the time is this area that is encircled in blue. We refer to that as the Central Maya Lowlands. And it is also important to note that this is a period of climatic stress. And that climatic stress is also made more complicated because of political and economic problems that the Maya were facing. So that's the perspective that I want you to have as I move into my presentation. And in fact, I should mention that um, in the, um, the fifth Shanghai conference that's coming up that my colleague uh, Jing and also here at UBC uh, is uh, helping to organize is on climate change and human responses. So if any of you go to it, it's going to be an awesome meeting. Anyway, so 
get out of there. So in the late 1970s, Gordon Willey published a paper in the volume Social Processes in Maya Prehistory. And Willey's work, in fact, the, his article, um, started off with a question. And that question is, you know, what significant external and foreign influences were affecting lowland Maya culture during this terminal classic period? And you notice he also said that every once in a while it's good to do some stock taking, right? Where were we 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and where are we now? In, in many respects, now I'm doing the same thing, but many, many years after Willie published his article. Willie's article was also influenced by two major factors. One of them is that in the 1940s, what, 35 years before Willie's paper, mas o menos, 37 years, um, this gentleman here, uh, Clarence Hay, had edited with some of his colleagues this volume on the Maya and their neighbors, which to some degree is the topic of our gathering you know, today and tomorrow. Right? And in the 1940s, there was not a lot of information about interaction between the Maya world and other places outside. Um, yes, you know, from the beginning of time, everyone thinks that the Olmec were the greatest civilization that introduced civilization everywhere. Some of us don't agree with that, but that's a whole different topic. Um, and of course, other people are talking about Teotihuacan. It's like, you know, all the periods in Mexican prehistory always is from the central area. First the Olmec, and then it was Teotihuacan, and then it was the Toltec, and then it was the Aztec, and it's like, whoa, right? The other places were also equally, right, developing around this time. So Willie then was taking stock of how much he and his colleagues had learned between the publication of Hayes' volume in 1940 and 1977. But there was another reason or another you know, uh, development that influenced Willie's writing of this chapter. And that is a Harvard University project had been working at the site of Ceibal um, in uh, the Petén province of Guatemala. And they had started to find architecture, the introduction of architecture that was non-local. They were finding also art and ideology that was not typical of lowland Maya ideology. For example, if you look at this stele, right? The stele, and in fact, the individual portrayed on that stele is also mustachioed, um, which again was rare uh, in, in, Maya, in the Maya world. And, and so one of the things that Willie's, some of his students, and to some degree Willie, thought, well, this stuff must represent evidence of invasion, right? People who are non-Maya move into the Usuma Sinta River drainage and they take over those cities and that's why we see these changes, right? In cultural expression, in architecture, in art, etc. cetera, right? Um, well, many of these, you know, th this type of information eventually made their way to another very seminal volume on Maya prehistory, and that was the first, one of the first volumes on the collapse of Maya civilization. And throughout that volume, most people suggested that new influences coming into the Maya world were a direct result of invasion, right? So we're gonna touch on that topic. And this invasion, according to them, came down the Gulf Coast up the Usumacinta River and was especially manifested at the sites of Ceibal and Altar de Sacrificios. What is ironic about some of this is that this archaeologist who had been working in Belize for most of his life had already talked and discussed about the discovery of objects that were non-local. In fact, Eric Thompson, as far back as 1939, in fact, he worked at the site called San Jose in Western Belize um, and wrote this, the, the volume was published in 1939, but in the 30s, Thompson had recognized evidence for influences coming into central Belize. And there you can see where the site of San Jose is located. I've been working in this area here of the Belize Valley. What is it that Thompson found? Well, he found quite a number of these objects here. We call them spindle whorls. You guys know all about spindle whorls. And Willie, sorry, 
Thompson said that those spindle whorls were decorated in a style that was Huastecan. And the Huastec, obviously, we know are from the Gulf Coast of Mexico. He also noticed that they were covered with asphaltum. Right? It's sort of like a material you find in areas with petroleum. And we now know that Petromex, right, or Petroleos Mexicanos, Pemex, is centered in the Gulf Coast of Mexico. So you know, it makes sense that some of this material is coming from the Gulf Coast into Western Belize. He also found other types of materials like ceramics, um, particularly fine, um, fine wear of uh, fine orange. I think I have it up here, maybe not. Uh, fine orange ceramics um, that were non-local. Several years later, two of my colleagues, Diane and Arlen Chase, Diane was uh, working at the site of Nomul, and she found some architecture that was also non-local. Um, all the rest of the site was built in typical, traditional, classic period Maya architecture, but not that building. Right? That building seemed to indicate ties with the north, with Yucatan. So much so that you know, later on they said, architecture is a really important cultural feature for determining relationships. Why? Because architecture is not portable. You can't pick up a building and say, I'm going to Belize and put that building there. No, it's, right, it's more interaction ideology being exchanged. So with that sort of background and that context, here's what I want to do in my presentation. I want to first, right, I'm going to present with new evidence since Thompson's work and since um, Gordon Willey's work for great interaction that took place around this critical period in Maya prehistory. After I present the data, we're going to discuss the origins and the timing of these influences, because that's critical. Right? It's important to know the when, where, how, why for you to interpret the significance of any kind of archaeological data. Thirdly, I want to examine whether these changes are related with any specific changes in the social, political, economic, and environmental systems around this time. So get ready for a lot of data. Now, I'm going to focus, like I said, in Western Belize, that area right on the border with Guatemala. Uh, because this is the area that I have been doing my research since the last 500 years. <laughs> Limping around today, it does feel like 500 years. So, yeah. so I'm also going to look at various types of data. Right? We're going to start off looking at architecture. As I said, architecture, great, right? great evidence for determining culture uh, change, cultural interaction, etc. And I already said that because that's the quote from the chases that, like you said, architecture is non-portable. So really good evidence. So let's get right into it. Since 2000, I've been doing some research at a site called Shunantanich. It's one of the bigger sites in Western Belize. And in fact, most of the site is in Belize, and then some of the settlement extends into Guatemala. And uh, no, we're not going to take Melchor de Mencos yet um, you know, so that we can claim it. I'm kidding. Um, but anyway, so when I was excavating at Chinantinich, right, we noticed that the ball court, ball court one, was in a style that was atypical. No Beli Western Belize ball court is in this shape. Right? We have a shape, and it's standard, and it goes from pre-classic times right up to you know, terminal classic period, except for the structure. And what was even more significant is that when we were excavating right there by the base, we found this section and that piece of a ball court ring. This other piece comes from a different ball court ring. It doesn't match with that. It comes from over there. Now, where is it that we have ball courts with ball court rings? Not in the central, well, we don't have one, right? but it's not common in the central Maya lowlands. It is very typical of the architecture of the Yucatan, especially the Puk region of Yucatan. And one of the classic examples of this is the site of Ushmal. This is the great ball court at Ushmal. And you notice, right, it goes up in the talus and then straight, and then there is the ball court marker, right? And it's tenoned inside the building. So if you go to the east, this is another example 
of one of these ball courts with the tenon ring from the site of Cova in Quintana Roo. Now, when, I, when we found this, I go, holy cow, is Shunantinich unique in the sense that it is the only ball court in the central lowlands with ball court marker? Uh, well, I was a little disappointed because we're not the only ones. But I was really happy because it showed right, that this interaction was not singular. Um, and in fact, a ball court marker at the site of Naranjo even had you know, some hieroglyphic uh, in inscriptions on it, which by the way, it mentions that it's the ball court. Um, well, another site, not too far away, site of Shultun, also has one of these rings. Now, another, like I said, when we looked at the architecture of our ball court with that from other sites across Mesoamerica, here's what we see. So here is the reconstruction or the section plan of our ball court at Shunantunich. Here's the one from Chichen Itza. Well, the one at Chichen, if you've been there, and I'm sure many of you have, is massive, right? Um, but if we go up here, look at Ushmal, right? Look, Xochicalco, which is not Maya, right? It's towards central Mexico. Um, it also has ball court rings, showing that th these interactions are going in various directions, right? Not just in one. Um, here again, you can see Copan. Copan doesn't have the ball court rings. It has some macaw powered heads uh, on it. So again, regional differences in architecture. Well, about four years ago, one of my colleagues who works at the site of Buena Vista, which is about three kilometers from Shunantanich, calls me up and said, Jaime, you won't believe what we just found. We found an acha. Now, acha is a ball game playing paraphernalia. And it is typical of ball courts at places along the Gulf Coast especially at the site of El Tahin. And again, El Tahin is as Maya as I am Scottish. Right? No <laughs> connection there. So, you know, and my colleagues who found this, when they started to do their research, they found that other people had found manoplas. Manoplas, it's like, a, it translates uh, from Spanish to English like a mitt, right? Or some, or um, what do you call this thing that people who like to fight, uh, what? Not, not the back, boxing glove. The, but anyway, it's something that you put in your hand and, um, what? Yeah. Um, so we know that it's likely that some of these materials were sometimes used when people play the ball game. And as I said, they are very common in the Gulf Coast, especially at the site of El Tahin. Now, other forms of architecture that we started to find. Here's the Castillo. I had excavated the front of this in um, between 2001 and 2002, and then we conserved it. And then I started this other big conservation project in about 2015. One of the first buildings that I excavated was this little structure that I had assumed may have been a residence or maybe a special function uh, structure. So there's one of my grad students from Northern Arizona University. Um, I said, all right, Hannah, there's your MA thesis. Go to it. And there is the before picture. And later on, after it was excavated, uh, one, another one of my grad students did some drone photography. And there's the little building excavated. Now, let me show you the photo of it. So that's what it looked like when we were done excavating and conserving it. And right away, what struck me were these. They are circular pillars. I have never, I've excavated all the big sites in Belize before I moved to New, um, Arizona, I was the director for the Belize Institute of Archaeology. So we excavated and conserved sites across the country. This was the first one I ever saw with round pillars or circular pillars. So definitely atypical. And when I started to look at comparisons, this is what I found, right? If you go to Chichen Itza, especially at the Templo de los Bujos, um, there you can see the Templo de los Bujos. That's the structure there. And you look, it's got two round pillars right at the door and an interior section there. Um, there you can see some examples of Yucatan. And even going into the post-classic period at the site of Mayapan, you can see another example right here. And this is, this is later at Mayapan. Round structures. Now, round structures have been known in Belize going back to about 800 BC. 
I know because I did my PhD on the pre-classic of Kahal, at Kahal Pitch, and we found several round structures. But then sometime around the late pre-classic period, sometime before right, the start of the Christian era, nobody built round structures anymore. They go the way of the dodo. And we don't start to see round structures again until this terminal classic period. And here is an example. One of my other uh, former grad students uh, excavated this. And you can see, right, the round structures there. Here's a reconstruction drawing of what this building may have looked like. Well, terminal classic period round structures have been found at several other sites. We found one at the site of Baking Pot, which is one of the four sites that I've been excavating. And they're common across Yucatan, going up from Bekan all the way north to places like Chichen Itza, Ushmal, Kaba, Sahil, et cetera, right? And here you can see the one at Bekan. And again, it's got three different levels. At the site of Nakum, which is just across the border from Shunantanich, right? Um, Zoral Khan and some of his co colleagues um, excavated this one. And again, similar type of round structure added much later. And remember where we started? The Usuma Sinta, Sebal? Well, one of the structures that was obviously foreign at Sebal when Willie was, wrote his paper was this structure. This is a black and white photo of that structure. And there is a drawing of that round structure at Sebal. Once this started to go, I started to notice that there was really considerable information on architectural influences in this terminal classic period. Um, and here, let me show you some other examples. This is the site of uh, Shpuhil. I don't know if any of you have been to Shpuhil. Really cool site, um, not too far from Chetumal, the capital of um, Quintana Roo. Um, and Tatiana Praskuryakov, who was a master beyond masters, did this beautiful volume where she reconstructs in artistically the architecture of many of the Puk region sites. Um, here's a drawing of it, and there I am standing. I notice I didn't have any gray hair yet. Um, I actually highlighted white. It makes me look a little more, you know, respectable. <laughs> At least I fool myself about it. Anyway, so here we go. You can see there are non-functional stairs. Right? They're about that wide. I'd kill myself if I tried to climb it now with my, you know, gimpy foot here. But anyway, when I excavated this eastern structure of the ball court at Caracol in western Belize, right away I noticed that that, here it is again, and I purposely took the same kind of photo. You know, there's my feet, right? It is a non-functional stairway. And where do we find this? Like I said, at Chpuhil and further north, right? It is atypical with the architecture of western Belize. And here you can see a drawing. One of the things, too, that I remember, you know, thinking about it when we excavated this structure is that here's the ball court. The back of that building is actually the ball court, the eastern ball court structure of ball court two or ball court B at Caracol. And this plaza that it faces is the principal plaza at Caracol. It faces the royal palace. And it's almost like the Maya said, we cannot have the back side of the ball court building facing our most important courtyard. So let's put, borrow this concept, put fake stairways, and it looks like a temple. Right? So it's really interesting when you can go, when you can actually see how the Maya were thinking when they were building their architecture. We have found some other examples in Western Belize, and here you can see uh, this is the site that Lord over. Uh, we didn't expose any more of it, so I'm going to just quickly jump over there. Some other examples of Yucatecan architectural styles that start to move south at this time. Those, uh, that is radial platforms. Some people call it dance platforms. Um, and so here you can see one by the, um, the governor's uh, residence or palace at uh, the site of Ushmal. And there is a close up of it. You can see these little radial platforms, generally but not always, have steps on the four sides of it. This is one at the site of Palenque, right? Same idea, same concept, right? Stairs on the four sides. And there is a close up of the one from Palenque. 
it continues into the post classic. This is the site of Mayapan again. So it starts up in the Puk region and then gradually starts to uh, work its way across. Well, we found a couple of them in Western Belize. Here you can see one at this site called the Benke site. Unfortunately, a bulldozer had been moving into this area, so we came in and stopped it. Um, they were going to develop it for residences, and we said, uh uh, right? That's, that's an archaeological site. So we finished excavating it, but nonetheless, it is the same. Right, same concept. At the site of Lubantun, look at the radial platform at the center of that courtyard. Added later, right, after the site had been going. This is just a drawing of that site core at Lubantun and a close up of the building. Another, one more architectural feature, and then we're going to jump on to some other types of, uh, how are we doing there with time? 25. I have 25 minutes? <laughs> All right, <laughs> Alvaradas, right? If you've been to the Yucatan, you will have seen Alvaradas, right? These are these property walls that they extend all over the place. In fact, here you can see some examples. They are still being constructed in Yucatan to demarcate, right, private space or family space. But we find some of them in Western Belize. And for some reason or the other, most of my colleagues in the past, they find walls, and guess what the explanation is? Warfare, right? It's like, oh, give me a break. You know, you got to be a little more, um, you know, you got to tease out this data a little bit better um, and don't jump to very simple explanations. So there you can see the, you know, this low wall that I think is an albarada. Well, walls were made for different purposes. Um, here's a LIDAR image of a site called Barton, Lower Barton Creek that one of my grad students did for their MA thesis. And look at this wall. It is purposely built to, you know, to direct the flow of traffic right through the ball court and into the main courtyard. Right? So walls are not just offensive. Right? Sometimes they used to, in fact, we do them today on highways right, to direct traffic. Um, at Caracol, there is a wall going around there. And that can't be defensive. I mean, how much would it protect the rest of the downtown part of Caracol, very little. So again, very likely an Alvarada. Artifacts, I already mentioned the discovery of spindle whorls painted with asphaltum that uh, Eric Thompson found at San Jose, and we talked about the, right, the achas. Well, just like Thompson had found ceramic vessels that were what he called slateware, so have we at some of the other sites in Western Belize. We also have found evidence of the use of Maya blue. Now, Maya blue starts up much earlier, but we know from recent studies that there's only one source of production for Maya blue, and that is around a village called Sakalum in Yucatan, northwestern Yucatan, towards from Merida to Campeche. Right? So again, we know the source of some of this material. I took this photo. These are different imitation slateware from Belize, and I took this photo at the Museo Nacional in Mexico City, and you can see it's, it was dark, but you can see it's more like the color that we see there. Fine orange pottery. Now, this stuff comes in from the west, comes down the Usuma Sinta River, and is introduced in there. You notice what, I'm, what, what we're seeing here, right? There are different trajectories from which some of these influences are coming from. It's not just you know, from one area. Another really cool discovery that we made was this quadruple flute at the site of Baking Pot. Here's a drawing of it. And having had, since I had been to the Museo in, in Mexico, I remember seeing a big display of musical instruments, especially flutes and quadruple flutes. And look at that one. That's the one from Belize. I mean, it looks very much alike. Right? And these are typically from the Veracruz or the Gulf Coastal area. But of course, Terminal Classic. What about other parts of you know, the, the Americas? Well, about 10 years ago, I started to notice that at some of our sites in Western Belize, there were these esferas, as they're called in Costa Rica. And Costa Rica has esferas, or big right, stone balls, mm -hmm. that go from this big to bigger than the roof of this building here. And we still can't figure out what their purpose or function was. Well, we have them in Belize, too. So again, is this you know, suggesting right, contacts, right, interaction, introduction of concepts and ideas from lower Central America? There you can see two more at the site we excavated of the Macal River. And there are a bunch of them. I've now started to record them. And hopefully, one of my grad students is going to write a thesis on this. 
along with some of these lower Central America or even upper Central American contacts, obviously the introduction of plum bait, which is produced somewhere between Guatemala and El Salvador, that, that region there, and it starts to show up around this time. <laughs> what about ideology? Yes, I get my children to do weird things for me. Um, well, we also have evidence of right, the adoption of ideological symbols that are non-Maya around this terminal classic period. And elsewhere, I've argued, it's like, you know what? Chuck's just not doing it for us during times of doubt. So, hey, let's try somebody else's rain god, right? And we start to see evidence of the use of the Mexican storm god that people call Tlaloc. Um, obviously, in Yucatan at the at Balancanche cave, there are lots of these, you know, incense burners here. And, and, um, and Tlaloc is easy to identify because he always has a lot of teeth and these round goggle eyes. Well, look what we have found in Western Belize, right? I mean, there it's carved in slate. You can see all the teeth and the big goggle eyes. There is one in ceramic. This is a really poor rendition of it in one of the caves that I've been working at. Um, we found this carved in, on, on the um, side of this terminal classic period, Belize red ceramic. And I, one of my colleagues said, hey, you should take a look at this um, pot that was found at Esquintla, Guatemala. And look at the little Tlalocs, right? <laughs> and the big Tlaloc, and that's our potsherd in Belize. Now, like I said, Tlaloc is not a Maya uh, concept. Right? It comes from central Mexico first, and then down to Veracruz, and down to the Yucatan. Um, at the site of Caracol, again, flanking structure B5, are two big masks. And here you can see, again, lots of teeth, big round goggle eyes um, on the stucco decoration of this site. This we found in a cave. And here you can see that's the Mexican year sign. It's a stylized version of it. But hey, the concept's introduced. You don't have to expect to find it exactly identical to what we see. We also start to find patoli boards and pecked crosses. Right? Some of these pet crosses go back in time all the way to Teotihuacan in the early classic period, but become more common in central Mexico during the terminal classic. And in, at the site of Xunantinich, we have found several of these. You know, there you can see a drawing in this building, the, on the floor of the buildings. Well, at some sites, they're even carved on stele. Here is a stele from southern Belize. You can see the patoli, and this one's from Ceibal. Almost identical right, in this case. Now, along with this ideology comes in a lot of other concepts. We notice that in Yucatan, around the terminal classic period, and likely associated with this long-term drought, right? we know that the Maya perceive caves as very sacred landscapes. It's the place where the rain god lives, and it's the portal into the Earth Mother. Right? And so even today, there's a ceremony called the Chachak ceremony that's conducted in Yucatan, where before the planting season, you go to petition the rain god to come out and make rain so your corn will grow, and also to petition the earth spirits for a good harvest. So we start to see intensified use and ritual activity in caves coinciding with this period of long-term drought. Um, um, some of my work at the site, Actun uh, Tunichil Muknal, Cave of the Stone Sepulchre, and by the way, um, I'll have a couple of slides here with human remains if anyone uh, you know, is affected by that. I can just jump past those, so, right. Um, so we find a lot of evidence of, of you know, increasing use of caves, especially for rituals associated with rain. And let me show you a couple of slides. It's not just more offerings being taken in, right? For this concept of reciprocity, if you feed the gods, they will feed you. Well. Eventually, we also start to see an increase in child sacrifice. There have been two studies done of the cenote at Chichen Itza, where, you know, one by Harvard, one by Ina, and they found hundreds, about 400 human remains. More than half of them were children. And if you read Landa's um, Relación de las Cosas de Yucatán, children were the preferred victims of sacrifice to the rain god. And that was a concept that went right up into central Mexico, right? So again, we start to see this evidence of intensified cave rituals coinciding with this time. Now, when do these influences begin to be manifested? Let me just, those are the questions that I'm gonna answer them really quickly. Um, 
Arlen Chase once suggested that it very likely starts around 810 or the start of the 9th century AD. And what we find, because of all the dates we have now ran on some of our caves where we have found evidence of this interaction, they date from starting around 750 AD. And I noticed you had 700. And yes, you know, we can't be dead exact, but certainly more in the 8th century that we start to see these influences start to come in. Um, where are the, what are the origins? Remember when Gordon Willey wrote his article, most people were thinking, well, that's coming from, you know, down from the Gulf Coast into the Usumacinta River. Well, Willey didn't have the advantage that I have today, and that is the, you know, just the volume of data that we have now collected, not just for Western Belize. And what we see is that, no, right? It is going, Arlen Chase suggested, you know, a maritime and then up the rivers and also down the Usumacinta and around. Well, other people have suggested, right, down that center of the Yucatan Peninsula. And what's important about that, we know that during the conquest, right, many of the Spanish head from Merida, and there was an old trail, merchant's trail, that was being utilized in the post-classic period. So why not could, you know, this could also be another potential venue, or avenue, I should say, um, of these influences. And where are the materials coming from? I put this all in this table because I think it really is a good heuristic device to show you where the sources are. There, most of the materials we have seem to reflect ties with Yucatan. Um, there are some at the Gulf Coast, right? Especially around Tajin and some of those areas. Some at Central Mexico, like the Storm God, right? The Mexican year sign, pet crosses, comales, and arrow points. And then fine orange from the Usumacinta River area. Now, you notice I have a caveat right here, and that is, right, we recognize that you know, some of these influences could have been by down the line, not necessarily direct trade contact between, let's say, central Belize and the Gulf Coast. Um, and what were the sociopolitical and economic factors that led to this increase in foreign influences? Well, some people have suggested immigration and invasion, and some of us suggest interaction and emulation. And the reason is that, again, right, like I said, too many of us sometimes go, oh, it's warfare, it's invasion, etc." Well, you gotta be careful. Today we have powerful tools to determine immigration. We can do, right, bioarchaeology, like strontium isotope analysis. If permitted by host countries, you can do DNA, right, of some individuals. And we have been able to do some of that. And, you know, I can skip this. Tortolo, which is one, who was one of um, Willie's students, said, you know, again, warfare, warfare, invasion, invasion. Hold on. Right? Goods, ideas, concepts, raw materials are imported outside the context of military activity. Right? So we've done some bioarchaeology, strontium, et cetera. And guess what? We have found evidence of immigration, but they're not coming from afar. They're coming from neighboring sites, neighboring regions, trying to escape whatever is affecting them there. But they're not foreign, they're local. And so again, this goes, flies in the face of this idea of warfare. Um, so what we know then is this is all happening during this period of long-term drought when we see the disintegration of political systems, especially in central Petén. All the big players like Kalakmul, Tikal, Naranjo are starting to right, go down. Their demise is imminent. And so what happens is that whereas before we were getting most of our influences from that central area, this starts to shrink considerably. And as you can see in this slide, right, it eventually shrinks even more considerably. And so it leaves this void and new, you know, essentially setting the stage for new influences coming along the coast, coming directly from there, and also from the west. And we know that this is a period of increased maritime trade. So I want to end with just this one observation here. If you read any book on the Maya, you know, people have been touting Teotihuacan's role in establishing civilization in the Maya world. And I think that it has been going on for a little too long. And why? Because when we compare Teotihuacano's influences in the early classic in the Maya area to the influences I just shared with you, they pale in comparison. 
they pale in comparison. And Teotihuacan's influence is mostly seen, it's very elite-centric. Whereas these influences cross-cut right, societal uh, bounds, so much more important. Today, we still have some external influences coming into the central Maya lowlands. And I saw it firsthand as I was driving one day from Flores Petén back to the border with Belize. And if you look at the back of the truck, there's Tikal and Tecate. Tecate is as Guatemalan, as I said, as I am Scottish. <laughs> Thank you. Sí, señor, dime. Thank you, Jaime. I think it's an incredible uh, presentation. Uh, I I have a question. I, I, I see your present. I'm not a Majan. For me, Majans are like aliens, <laughs> you know, in Mexico, in central Mexican archaeology. Uh, and the the thing is, I, I saw like two different pulses from central Mexico because we saw the same going from central Mexico to west Mexico and northwest Mexico. Uh, one, it's like in 600, 700, as you said, when Teotihuacan collapsed and everything happens and Tajin have all this influence and there's a lot of uh, now very important works about asphaltum and things like that going on over there in Veracruz. As you see, I, I'm, I'm shocked about, about your presentation on this. But also the storm god and everything came from a different pulse in early post-classic. So you can see those differences in your, in your sites, like there's like a kind of a two different pulses that came into, into the Majan area, or you see it like a, a single thing, like a continue? No, no, you're right, there are two pulses. One in the, you know, towards the end of the early classic, coming from central Mexico, probably out of Teotihuacan. Um, and that's where we see, for example, some Talud Tablero architecture. Exactly, exactly. But it's really limited. Talud Tablero architecture has been found at uh, Tikal, yeah. a couple of the buildings there. They have been found at, um, I think, at Ush, not Ushmal, at um, Washaktun, a little bit. But it's very limited, right? And there's also one at, uh, in Copan, right? Um, and that's early classic. And then you have the other pulse, which is very late. Now, you said post-classic, but we start, we're seeing it much earlier. Many of the caves that I just you know, showed and some of the sites, we have no evidence of early post-classic whatsoever. So the pulse, that's why I said, you know, Arlen Chase originally suggested that maybe the ninth century, right? And our data is now pushing it a little earlier, around the eighth century, around 750 AD. Well, we need to talk more about that, definitely. Okay. Yeah, because we, see, we, we are seeing the same things happens in in other parts of Mesoamerica. Mm -hmm. Hola, Jaime, ¿qué tal? Muchas gracias por tu presentación. Gracias. Eh, bueno, también, yo trabajo en los Andes, por lo tanto, el mundo maya es totalmente desconocido. Eh, pero sí quería, eh, de alguna manera, destacar que, que los cambios que tú estás viendo son cambios realmente bien paradigmáticos en cómo entendemos eh, la arqueología y cómo entendemos la evidencia arqueológica a partir de, de sacar estos paradigmas del conflicto, de la guerra, que ha sido hecho también desde muchas veces nuestras arqueologías más coloniales, ¿verdad? O colonialistas. Eh, pero, bueno, eso era como parte de mi apreciación. Pero además quería preguntarte, ¿cuál exactamente es la evidencia biológica que ustedes tienen para hablar de posibles migraciones? Que no sé si la mencionaste o yo no la escuché, pero... Sí, Eso, um, muchas gracias. Así que el gobierno de Belice nos ha dado permiso para conducir, para, para hacer estudios de DNA, tanto strontium isotope. Y lo que hemos visto es que el DNA um, indica que los inmigrantes son de esa misma área, del, del área central de, del, de la, de la sección central del área maya y también de diferentes partes de Belice, que posiblemente ya se habían afectado más 
con eh, los cambios oh, de clima o de otros, uh, otros problemas. Um, así que eso es lo que indica ese estudio. Um, el strontium también, muy, muy importante para, para poder ver estos eh, esos movimientos de, de gente. Y lo que hemos visto, que el strontium indica que sí, de verdad, hay gente que se están moviendo de un lado a otro y que vienen también de, la, de las montañas mayas, como de Caracol, al Valle del Río Belice. Y eso hace buen sentido porque sabemos que durante un, una época de sequía, que esos lugares en los valles de ríos grandes, importantes, que había más agua y era más posible que podían hacer su vida ahí durante ese tiempo. Caracol no tiene, no tiene río, solo tiene um, cenotes, pero ni son cenotes uh, de reservoirs um, que se van a secar con, un, con, con una sequía de, de largo plazo. Así que no. <risa> 